welcome back our kid and I've got a very peculiar one for you this evening just bear with me though because I'm uh, obviously in my back bedroom again tonight I couldn't get in the studio with it being quite late that I decided I wanted to put this video together so if you enjoyed my recent interviews I want to thank Chris Rice of Rice TVX and M Seeker of Truth both of those guys for coming through for me and having a little chat I'll hopefully have them both back on the channel again soon I think that would be great to uh, expand on a couple of the topics that we talked about. If you haven't seen those interviews, by the way, you can go back and watch them now. Now, I wanted to talk about a, th a few, well, quite, there's quite more than a few, really, these loads of connections I've seen. If you remember, I'm a little bit obsessed with a a one of the specific UFO experiences I've had out of seven in my lifetime, which occurred last summer, which was these crazy black squid jellyfish balls with tentacle type things you know they were like crazy uh, I've done a lot of research into what they could possibly be I found similar videos online to what I experienced but not exactly the same so I've been looking into um, Xenobots uh, I've been looking into something called Xeno Jellies I'm about to talk about all of this uh, mysterious statues popping up all over the shop in Japan another one another two in Dallas even so we're going to go into that. Now, if you remember my Olympic Games 1992, 2012, on um, what was coming in the opening and closing ceremonies of 2022 videos, I mentioned quite a lot what, I'm, what was described as the Black Hydra, and we'll go into more depth on that. I've also referred to this as Black Goo. I've heard from, on the Tinfoil Hat podcast recently, that this, there's a big connection to alien blood. Now, I don't really want to go too deep into that but let me just show you all these strange things and these are all from about the week before well just December 2021 or it was about the week before Christmas New Year um, up until today so I want to go into this in quite some depth I also talked about this black goo in my Travis Scott deep dive and was it frequencies that set the uh, goo off that's inside the people and that's what made them react in the way they did obviously more than one person is responsible it wasn't all on Travis Scott or even Travis Scott and Drake even though the lawsuits would suggest otherwise it was the fault of the venue for letting too many people in over the capacity it was there's tons of people to blame let's be honest but it was still pretty damn shady. And, and the very first time I ever mentioned this was in a video named um, The Game of Squidage or Squid Games. And that's another reference, the most popular show on Netflix, believe it or not. Soon to have a season two. Um, okay, so first I want to get into Xenobots. You might have heard about them in the headlines last month. And what they are is um, self-replicating machines, basically. They are um, robots that can... Re well, they don't reproduce in terms of they're giving birth to young. They kind of put out m mini versions of themselves, kind of thing, if that makes sense. Here's a short video on what the Xenobots actually are, and then we'll go deeper onto the, um, well, I've got uh, Xeno jellies. I've got um, statues that keep appearing all over the place, and we'll talk a lot more about all that. So here we go. As Dr. Ian Malcolm once famously quipped, Life, uh finds a way. And that's exactly what has just been observed among a swarm of unique pseudo-organisms called Xenobots, first developed in 2020 at the University of Vermont. Xenobots are effectively living robots, biological machines designed from the ground up using skin and cardiac stem cells derived from the African frog Xenopus latus, hence Xenobots. The UVM team first spent months running an evolutionary algorithm on the Deep Green Supercomputer Cluster at the university's Vermont Advanced Computing Core to design and test the various shapes and functions these synthetic lifeforms might be able to use. Once their design was sufficiently refined, the team took a bunch of individual Xenopus stem cells and assembled them into the approximate shape specified by the algorithm using a set of minuscule forceps and electrodes. It takes around 3,000 cells to make a fully functional Xenobot, which can operate for up to two weeks at a time using their embryonic energy stores. Now, once these Franken cells were put together, they began to self-organize, using their cardiac cell contractions for locomotion to explore their environment. Researchers also observed emergent swarm behaviors, with groups of Xenobots working together to push and gather microscopic pellets into centralized piles within their aquatic environments. Researchers then realized that by cutting out a notch in each Xenobot, 
and making it look like a microscopic Pac-Man. The bots could individually collect and shift even larger amounts of pellets using far less energy. This allowed the Xenobots to operate more efficiently and for longer time periods before running out of energy and, well, dying. Now here's where things get really wild. The researchers have found that by replacing the pellets with individual Xenopus stem cells, the Xenobots can gather enough cells to create a second generation of themselves. Essentially, they reproduced, creating babies that would self-assemble into functional Xenobots after a brief incubation period. The UVM team hopes to further develop Xenobot technology into something a bit more functional, using them to potentially deliver drug molecules to specific parts of the human body, or having them gather and remove microplastics from waterways. Now, before you freak out, understand that this is not an Island of Dr. Moreau situation. This is not a new species of life that has been created by any means, at least not any more than the cells that make up your immune system are. Like white blood cells, these xenobots are alive in the technical sense, but they're not individual organisms capable of surviving on their own or replicating without outside assistance. Of course, they said the same thing about the chances of a population of all female dinosaurs spontaneously reproducing, and we all saw how that turned out. So, hold on to your butts. Interesting, right? Now, the next link is about Xeno jellies. So there's that word again. They were the Xeno bots. Now we're on to Xeno jellies. And I first discovered this exhibition um, from the Hyundai Art Lab. I believe it's done a bit of a tour, but I've got a video from the Tate Modern Art Gallery, which is, funnily enough, where my ex worked for many years. But this um, display went up by a, an artist I've never heard of called Anika Yi, who's from South Korea, I believe. And um, she's put up a new art inst uh, installation using floating machines to create an artificially intelligent ecosystem high above the heads of the visitors at the Tate Modern Art Gallery. So, well, let's have a look at the video. They move around the space guided by an artificial life system, so they are autonomous. They're not being controlled by people. Humans are neither master to them, nor are they slave to them. It's an encounter of uh, kinds. Now, a mysterious statue claiming to portray 1800s Dallas pioneer Sarah Horton Cockrell was placed in Pioneer Park Cemetery. Now, this statue is of a cephalopod. If you're into science fiction, you might know what a cephalopod is. This thing looks like a, it's got a squid's head, basically, and the body of a human. It even translates messages. You'll find the video very bizarre. It's the second of these bizarre statues, though, to uh, pop up in the city. The first, which claimed Dallas's founding father was part cephalopod, appeared in 2019. The statue was placed on the same concrete slab that once sat beneath the 65-foot-tall Confederate War Memorial that the city removed from the park in June 2020. So we can take down statues when they relate to history and replace it with this crazy fictional um, cephalopod. Okay, a plaque which accompanied the new statue, claimed that it was the work of 
and an, om an ominous Dallas artist named Solomon. Now, I don't understand how that protects his um, anonymous status, unless uh, that's a fake name that they've given out or whatever. And a donation to the city of Dallas by the late local oil tycoon, T. Boone Pickens. Now, I've left um, a little article as well in the description of this video uh, from D Magazine all about the second statue. But here's a video about the first. I hadn't seen anything like it. Standing on a pile of bones. That's threatening. The body of a woman. I wanted to make sure I got here before it disappeared. And the head of a cephalopod? A cephalopod, of course, is any member of the molluscan class, like a squid or an octopus. But you probably already knew that. I love stuff like this. I love this stuff. This mysterious statue showed up in Dallas Monday, anchored in at Pioneer Park Cemetery. I don't even understand what I'm breathing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a plaque at its feet says this is Sarah Horton Cockrell, known as Dallas's first capitalist. The name Solomon is also at the top, possibly the name of the artist. And it also says it's a gift from... T Boone Pickens? Why T Boone Pickens? Why is it T Boone Pickens? <laughs> Former council member Phil Boone. Kingston says none of it makes sense, and he likes it that way. Yet it gets weirder. You see these? We didn't know what they were, but someone on Twitter told us they're part of a number system made by medieval monks. This is true investigative journalism. And translate to a Dallas phone number. <laughs> if you call it, you hear this. <laughs> What do you think this guy's trying to say? Uh, I don't know, but I'm enjoying the hell out of whatever it is he's saying. And this isn't the first statue of its kind. In 2019, a similar one was erected underneath the K. Bailey Hutchinson Convention Center. The plaque also said Solomon at the top and accuses Dallas founder John Neely Bryant for being a cephalopod for whatever reason. So whoever worked on it was... Uh... <laughs> put a lot of detail in. But that's the thing. Who worked on this? There's a camera right there. I mean, if they catch him, what are they going to do? Charge him with vandalism? That's a city camera. The chances they don't they work. work. <laughs> Kingston doesn't really care. He's just glad he saw this gorilla art before it gets taken down. In Dallas, I'm Matt Howerton. Now, speaking of unusual um, squid statues popping up for a short period of time and then disappearing, just like these things do. You know, like the uh, monoliths we saw going up all over, well, all over the world, really, didn't we? We even had them here in the UK. I think they were on the Isle of Wight, but not the point. So Japan spent all its coronavirus release, relief money on this giant squid statue. And I'm about to show you what that looks in this short clip as well, and what it looks like. And the final section of this video is about the Kraken. Now, you might remember during the 17 um, Anom movement, uh, they talked quite a lot about release the Kraken this, release the Kraken that, release the Kraken the other. Now, I'm about to tell you a little bit about the mythology of the Kraken and what that actually is. And believe it or not, it's a giant sea monster from mythology. And um, that just reminds me straight away of the Beast of the Sea. You know, I made that video about the statue going up outside the United Nations, which I might, and I might now add has been removed after much uh, debate and a lot of talk about it, a lot of protests, a lot of stuff. They didn't want that up there. They didn't understand why something from Revelations was representing peace outside the UN. So it's been taken down. But in Revelations, there's two beasts, right? Uh, I can't remember which section and which verse of Revelations it is, but they talk about the beast of the land, which has these like crazy wings, uh, like a leopard's head or a lion's head or something. Or it could be, could be one of those big cats. And like the body of a, a 
it's got the feet of a bear and it's got the tail of a dragon and people don't even notice that part well that's gone but the second beast was the beast of the sea now release the kraken just sounds all too perfect doesn't it and let me tell you a little bit about the history of the kraken and this sea monster and then i'll come back to you for the outro below the thunders of the upper deep far far beneath in the abysmal sea is ancient dreamless unabated sleep the kraken sleeping <laughs> I'm Paul, and once again on behalf of Graveyard Shift, and this is the story of the largest and most fearsome ocean-dwelling monster in legend. Now, according to the NOAA, the National Ocean Service, less than 5% of the ocean has been explored. For what we know of the planet, most of it is undeniably a mystery. One of these is the accounts of the Kraken, which have existed since the 13th century, predominantly in the cold climates of the North Atlantic, around Iceland and Norway. Now, originally referred to as Hafgufa, sea mist in Icelandic, and said to be able to sink a ship and devour its entire crew at once, the anonymous author of an old Norwegian scientific work, Kanunskuska, circa 1250, said, There is a fish that is still unmentioned, which it is scarcely advisable to speak about on account of its size, because it will seem to most people incredible. There are only a few people who can speak upon it clearly, because it is seldom near land, nor appears where it may be seen by fishermen. It would eventually be known as the Kraken, a Norwegian word meaning something twisted, unable to reproduce because there were so few in number. Mariners would speak of a creature so large it could be mistaken for an island. Some described it as crab-like, while others said it resembled a whale. Now in the 18th century, it appeared in several volumes systemizing the natural world. It would be given the scientific classification Microcosmus Marinus. In 1853, Norwegian naturalist Jeppe Strindstrup recovered the beak of a giant cephalopod stranded on a Danish beach. He was able to scientifically identify and describe the giant squid, now known to grow up to 60 feet in length, and the cause of the huge scars on sperm whales from their duels. It's just the kraken those ancient mariners saw. Now, does it still exist? Perhaps like the beluga whale, they are not keen on the presence of human men, prefer a deeper habitat. With 95% of the ocean still unknown, we obviously can't say for sure. I'm Paul on behalf of Graveyard Shift, and this has been a story of how the legend of the Kraken came to be. So like I say, I'm just a performance artist. I'm an entertainer, and I'm pointing out what I'm seeing in the world. It's up to you to use your own discernment to tell them well, if you think it's true, great. I love having these uh, interactions with you in the comments. I get some really positive stuff. And if you're new to the channel and you've just subscribed, thank you very much. If you haven't yet subscribed, please like, share and subscribe the, to the channel uh, because I'm trying to make this as big as I can. I'm trying to grow it now because I believe that the information that I'm sharing is extremely important. But like I say, it's performance art and it's nothing but speculation. That's what this channel is. You tell me if you think there's anything more to it. I personally think it's very unusual. And I've left two more links in, in the description for you. One is Hydra DNA uh, reveals there's more than one way to grow a head. So this the DNA of this Black Hydra, um, it can replicate limbs, it can grow arms, it can be chopped up or whatever, and it grows back. Um, there's a little clip of that, of that and how they behave in... Um, I can't even say the full word, I think. I'm going to call it graphic oxide. And you use your own imagination to guess what I'm talking about. Um, and the second story is a gene tweet jellyfish that offers a glimpse of other minds. So this is all about the neurology of the jellyfish. And like I say, I believe all this stuff is linked personally. I think it pretty much is. And it's something we should be keeping an eye on, especially in these curious times when we had that discussion last June, which was supposed to be full disclosure about from the Pentagon and uh, some other services in the US about how much they knew about UFOs. But we got a nine page nothing burger. But still the timing of them even admitting that it's real, it's a real phenomenon is strange, very strange, you know. Um, I know what I've seen. I've had seven experiences. All of them have been vividly different. I don't know if this makes me a lucky man or whether it makes who's got eyes to see and ears to hear or whether it makes me um, cursed, basically. I, don't, I just don't know. I'm just rolling with it. But like I say, the most interesting of my all of my experiences were these squid-type jellyfish things that flew from the horizon to right above my house and just so happened to be the same night that my next-door neighbour died. Peculiar, right? Thanks for joining me tonight, guys. I've been Mark himself. I'll see you next time.